All right, then, if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask to turn to Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is where we'll take our text, and we're going to begin reading in verse 20. Uh, psalm 73, uh, verse 20, and this psalm is a psalm of Solomon, uh, not the usual writer David, but his son. And definitely he saw some things as he got older in a different light than he did when he was younger. Uh, Psalm 73, beginning in verse 20, the Bible says, As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked to my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was, in, I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast held me up by, thy, by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon, and there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they are far from, from thee, for lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee, but it is good for me to draw nigh to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for an opportunity to meet with your people tonight. Lord God, we pray that you would come in, that you would meet with us in this place, Lord, that you'd fill your house with your presence. Lord God, we pray that you might save someone according to your mercy and grace tonight, that you'd make them certain of their situation before you and that you'd stir them uh, to life, that you would breathe spiritual life into them. God, we pray that you would honor your word at this time with your presence, and we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching uh, this evening on drawing near unto the Lord. Now, a lot of us say that we want to be near to the Lord, but we don't always necessarily uh, prove that, and uh, we don't all necessarily do what it takes. Uh, we want simplistic things, but if you want a near walk with the Lord, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you energy. You're going to have to let a few other things go if you want to be near unto the Lord. And Solomon sees this uh, as he gets older. Now, back in our text in verse 20, he says, As a dream, when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Now, uh, if you read a little bit before that, apparently Israel had got involved in a lot of idolatry, and, and Solomon just compares when he wakes up and sees it. Now, first of all, the Lord God never goes to sleep. He was fully aware of the idolatry, but he was just given an example when God sees the situation for what it is. Now, we need to wake up tonight and see the situation for what it is. Uh, if you watch that presidential debate last night, you'll see how foolish our country has become. It looked like two children up there, Adam and Matthew, arguing all over again when they were, when they were kids. It, it was pathetic. And you think about that. All, all of us fellow nations around us were sitting there watching that and wondering how stupid we really could be. But... We are in the same condition if we don't wake up spiritually and see what's going on. See, you can be a saved individual and be asleep spiritually. Again and again, the churches of the Revelation, the Lord said uh, they needed to uh, uh, wake up or he was going to remove their candlestick. And that's what we need as well is just to wake up for the situation. Verse 21 Solomon says, thus my heart was grieved. Now, if you wake up 
and see yourself in a situation, and he was looking at Israel and looking at himself, if you're in a bad way spiritually, you ought to be grieved. It should not be something that you take delight in. And it should, even being cold to the things of the Lord, that ought to shame us somehow that we'd want to do better, that we would want to be nearer unto the Lord. Yeah. But very frequently it doesn't. And so we find, as Solomon was writing, the national situation of Israel caused him fear, caused him a heartache, and uh, he desired to wake up. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. Now, two things there. Every one of us is our own leader. And he was the leader of the nation as well. He said, I was pricked in my reins. Uh, now, I fully believe God is sovereign, but listen, you're the leader of your spiritual life. And if you want to be productive, you'll be productive. And if you don't, you sit on your little stool and do nothing. And sadly enough, I think the majority of us in the modern days in that section, second section where we do nothing. And the reason I, it, it has to be that way or the fields wouldn't have brought, uh, brought different levels of harvest. Some 30, some 60, and some 100. And, and, and so we find then that as Solomon is writing this down, he says, uh, I'm going to do something with these rings. I've got to lead myself and lead these people in a different way. Verse 22, so foolish was I. Now, you get the picture here, but you've got to remember who's speaking. The wisest man that ever lived, he says, I was foolish. Now, you can be smart and be foolish. Really, uh, using your intelligence uh, is it a given? I saw some very smart people that did, I don't think had no sense of coming out of the rain. And the same way, he was very intelligent and he had wisdom, but he calls himself foolish. Why? Because he wasn't putting first things first. What had become first things first with uh, Solomon was making unity with all the nations that were around them. You know, that, that wasn't his to do. Uh, uh, ever since God's people existed, both in Old Testament times and New Testament times, they've been a little people, according to the Bible, and full of trouble. Uh, listen, we're not going to fit in. We're not going to be part of the crowd. And really, uh, just like the Queen of Sheba, I think the reason he took her in was simply to make things smooth. Remember, uh, I can't remember, but I think it is in uh, 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 First Chronicles. He said, "Teach us smooth things." Right. Um, yeah. They they didn't want anything that cold along the way, and really we've arrived there again. And so, as someone is writing this down, he compares himself to a fool, to an idiot, to someone that didn't have any spiritual knowledge at all. Uh, and that's where we're at. Notice this. So foolish was I and ignorant I was as a beast before thee. Now I personally believe that he was saying this before huh, and when he got down to the years of writing the Ecclesiastes he, he found out what life was about, didn't he? And he says before I was just ignorant I was like an animal. And you know, many of us are the same way. Listen, if you're lost tonight, I can guarantee you, you're just like an animal. Uh, what makes you go is what you want. What you want out of the situation makes you go. The same, uh, the, the same principle applies. And Solomon says, I was there. I was in that condition. I was, I was doing things just like that. That was my station. Verse 23. Nevertheless, despite my foolishness, despite my condition, nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden up my right hand. Thou hast holden me by thy right hand. So Solomon realizes even when he's in the biggest mess imaginable that the Almighty is right there with him. You know, how could somebody lead a nation like that without being under the hand of the Almighty God? Uh, and, and, he, and Solomon acknowledges that at my worst point, 
You were right there with me, taking care of me, providing for my needs, steadying me along the way, giving me guidance, taking uh, all the time that this was going on. And so certainly we ought to be as uh, the same way as to be led by the Lord God um, as Solomon was. Verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Now, that's a, that's a very good question because today people are so foolish. They're talking about mama and daddy and grandmother. And, you know, who had David as his father? The Bible says it was a man after God's own heart. Never describes a person like that in the same way in the entirety of the Bible. And see, he didn't say, I've got David and I'm going to see daddy when I get there. He said, I don't have anybody up there but you. You are the only one that's my advocate. You are the only one that's my sustainer. You're the only one that's going to keep me going when I have nothing else to go for. You are him. And so we find then that David under, understood and knew the nature of God. He says, you, I, I have nobody but you. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. Now that's your, that, that's your, that's where you need to be. Now you think, uh, I can't remember right now how many wives, I think what, three, uh, a thousand wives and three hundred concubines or maybe the other way around. Uh, and he said, I don't have anybody but you. He, he's, that's, that's not a sad spot, that's a good spot. When, when you know without a shadow of a doubt that the only person, the only advocate, the only real thing that's out there is you and God, you have finally put him first. And that doesn't come with a snap of your fingers and, and that doesn't come with easiness, but that should be his position in your life. Notice what it says again, that uh, is I don't have anybody up there but you <laughs> and that and there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. So where is your desire at? Where is your interest at? Where, where is it at? And you think about even David. When David was dying, what did they do? Do y'all remember? They sent a woman in there to try to warm him up. Right. So where was his desire? They knew that about David, did they not? How would they, how would they know to do that if that wasn't his character? And Solomon, the next generation, comes along and says, I don't have anything but you. I, you are what I want. So I guess the base question tonight, if you want to be near unto the Lord, how important is he to you? But where, where does he rank at uh, in, in your in your things uh, in, in your uh, desire to serve him, you know, uh, I love my family, I love my children, my grandchildren, my wife, and I wouldn't change nothing. But David was, very, I mean, but Paul was very specific. He knew those relationships would interfere with his ministry, and so I believe with singleness of heart is how Paul wanted it. And that's the, that's the ministry that he had. So I ask you tonight, uh, where is he at in your list of priorities? Where, is he, where does he abide in what you're doing? Verse 26, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now that seems repetitive, but I want to point it out to you. He says, uh, my flesh and my heart fail. Now that first heart, when he says my flesh, it's this ticker in there that one day it will stop. And when that stops, we're done. We're out of here. You're going to eternity someplace when that occurs. He says, my heart faileth this heart. But he says the next one don't. The next time he uses heart in the same sentence, He's talking about the never dying soul. Really, it's a different word in the, the Hebrew. There are two distinctive words, and here there, the English translation, it's the same word. But God is the strength 
of my heart, the strength of my soul, the strength of my inward man, the strength of who I am, the one that's going to exist beyond now, he is that strength of that part. And then notice he says, and my portion forever. You know, what a wonderful, blessed thing to think about tonight. When we leave here, he's our portion forever. Amen. You know, we don't even get a hold of what forever is. Because we, we measure everything in seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and years. And that somehow Solomon got the idea that he's going to be with me forever and I'm going to be with him forever. It, it, it's a never-ending thing. We're going to be there. And when you get near unto the Lord, and because it's eternity that we're talking about, if you get near unto the Lord, that's why this stuff will become kind of a, kind of second. Because we know this is so temporal. When we're near unto the Lord, these things that we have now, the things that we do now, are very temporal, and the spiritual things become firsthand. Verse 27, For lo, they are far, for lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Now, did it say, <laughs> those that are far from you? Now, we're talking that Solomon had been talking about a nearness the whole time how he wanted to be with the Lord. And then he comes back and says, those that are far from you, they're going to perish. What do you think about people who say they're saved and never attend church? Yeah. What, what do you think about people that say they're saved and look and act like the world? What, what do you think about people uh, that say they're saved and they look like hookers? What do, you, what do you think? You know what? The only thing I can come to is that if they're saved, they're far from me. And the Bible says, here they'll perish. Right? And, and, and so we find then that this closeness that, that Solomon is explaining comes with a price. And you're going to have to give some things up. You might not have what everybody else has, and you may not look in your mind as good as everybody else looks. But you know, in the, in the, in the span of time and eternity, what matters the most? Which is going to be the priority? And, and so we find that Solomon comes to this conclusion that the individuals that are out there that don't desire this closeness, that they're going to perish. The rest of that verse says... Thou hast destroyed all them that go pouring from thee. Now, I want you to see that it says pouring from thee and going pouring from him or God. They had to be with him at one time previous, right? That only makes sense. So if they go pouring off in this direction from God, it's the enticements of this world that gets their attentions. You know, when, when you are attracted to a young lady and you want to court her, you go to her, right? You, and so when they're attracted by the world, they just go that way, hook, line, and sinker. Now, if you don't think that's true, think about our churches. And, and me and Brother Clark were talking about this the other day. What kind of change it's been in 20 years? It's like a different environment out there. It really is. Why, why is that so? Why is our churches filled with so worldliness and coldness? I can tell you why. They went a horn in their own direction, and they wanted the enticements of this world and the pleasures that this world provides, and the end result, there's nothing left in here. Yeah. And, and so we find then as the Lord's people that we need to make our priorities very, very sure. And if we're going in this direction, that we would come back. That, in fact, is what repentance is all about. Verse 28, But it is good for me to draw near to, the, to God. You know what? What a wonderful thing. It is good for me to draw near unto God. 
You know what? If you can say that tonight, you're in a good spot. And if I tell you, you're in a better spot if you know you could always be a little closer to where he wants you to be. Because none of us has arrived. We've got this stinking flesh to deal with. None of us has arrived yet. And so what, what about you? Where, where is your condition? Solomon's idea, his main thrust was to be near unto God. You know, what to God for me that I wouldn't wait to be on my deathbed till I drew these same conclusions. You know what? Uh, in fact, at the end of his life in the Ecclesiastes, and some scholars suggest that these were written very close to the same time, he, he came to this conclusion. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. In other words, having that huge kingdom and that beautiful palace and all being all over of all the riches. He says, you know what? It don't mean a whole lot. It, it, it don't really mean what I thought it would mean. <coughs> and so we find then what he concluded to be the priority is to be near unto the Lord, to be close unto him, to be close to uh, where he would have us to be. But it's good for me to draw near to God. I put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Now the last thing, and we're going to read some of the New Testament, but the last thing that Solomon says that he could declare his works. So I'm assuming and I'm guessing that when they went down to the temple and like when the Queen of Sheba came and, and it said that she made comments of all the palace and the unbelievable temple, that maybe he said, that's the Lord. And the reason it's there is that is because of the Lord. And when people come along, why do you do this? Why do you do that? I don't see anybody else doing that. You say, because of the Lord. Why do you wear dresses all the time? It's because of the Lord. Why don't I, uh, you know, the mullet's coming back. And uh, what if, uh, why don't I grow me another mother down? <coughs> One thing I'm still fit, uh, scared of my in-laws. But the other, the real reason is the Bible said it would be a, a shame unto me. Do you, do you want that? And so we find then that if we're going to have this close relationship, then it's going to cause something on, this, on the side of this flesh and we just have to go on. Go with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. I want to, uh, we're going to read some items about Peter because Peter often reminds me of myself. And Peter, like all of us, had good days and bad days. He had some days where he was near unto the Lord, and he had some days when he was far, far from the Lord. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. The Bible says, And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting an net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he, meaning Christ, saith unto them, meaning Peter and Andrew, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Now, I want you to see that this is the first uh, uh, indication of a person named Peter in the Bible, in the Lord Jesus Christ ministry. And he looks at Peter and says, follow me. I'm going to change your occupation. You're not going to go fishing anymore. You're going to go fishing for men. And the Bible says they follow him. But, you know what? There's a, a lot of followers of Christ that are not saved. Before the Lord saved my children, they came to church. And you know what? They came to church because I said so. That don't, mean a, that don't make them a Christian, does it? And so what do you think Paul, uh, Paul did this? I mean, excuse me. What do you think Peter did this? Well, well, he was just being obedient. He was honoring the ministry of Christ, but he did not know Christ. And you know what? When you don't know Christ and you're going through the motions, you're most apt to fail every, every time because you don't, you don't have a new nature. You have the same nature that you were born with. 
Now go with me to Matthew 16, uh, very familiar verses. And in the interim, there was a lot, a lot of hard knocks for Peter, but he hung on. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. Matthew 16 and verse 13. The Bible says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom did ye say, did ye say that I am? And that's a wonderful question that the Lord Jesus Christ still asks it today. Who do you say Christ is? Now, you know, uh, and, and I guess because I've been studying the Bible and I've heard good sound preaching for so many years, you know, it just inks the hair on the back of my neck to, somebody, to hear somebody say Jesus is trying to save you. He, like he's incapable unless you, unless you let him. That's, that's not much of God, is it? So when they were saying, Thou art the Christ, they were saying a mouthful. They were saying, You're a lot more than a preacher. You're a lot more than a prophet. You're a lot more than what Elijah and Elisha were. You are the Christ. The, you, you are him. You're the one that's been spoken of. You're the one that's been promised. You are him. And so uh, he said, and, and he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? The only one. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So I want you to see I personally believe that this is when the Lord saved Peter. He had probably been following Christ a year and a half and just going through the motions, just doing it because that's what everybody else was doing. Doing. And here, the person of the Lord God, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ was revealed to him. And he said, Thou art the Christ. You're him. You're the one. You're the one we've all been looking for. And, and so we find that Christ. I mean, excuse me, that Peter was a genuinely saved person. He had been born again, as the Lord told Nicodemus. He, he knew who Christ was. It was revealed for, to him by the Almighty. Here, Peter was saved. Now, I want you to look with me, Matthew. Uh, Gospel of Matthew, this time, chapter 26, um, verse 72. Matthew 26 and verse 72. The Bible says this. And again, he, meaning Peter, and again, he denied him with an oath, saying, an oath, an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him, and they, they that stood by, and said to Peter, Surely also thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. And he began to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, that's a saved man. That's a man that knows the Lord Jesus Christ. And denied him on three separate occasions. And the last time he went to cuss him to deny who his character really was. Now, don't get on down on Peter. Because I know I've denied him a lot more than three times. And you have two, if you be honest. And and, and we need to be. <laughs> what do you think Paul, I mean Peter's prayer life was right then? What was Peter's closeness into the Lord? How was his walk going? Well, you ever think about how he got that way? He was scared to death. You, you, you know what will hinder your faith more than anything? Being fearful. 
being scared, being upset, uh, looking around as the, as the world falls apart and say, what am I going to do? Well, I'll tell you real quick, you ain't going to do nothing. You depend on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to get you through, to bring you a meal by the ravens, or however he wants to do that, but you're not going to do nothing. And as soon as we realize that, really, really convinced that the sweetest peace will come over you that you've ever, ever known. And so we find then that Peter fell flat on his face, and sometimes we will too. He was far from Christ, and he needed to be drawn near unto it. And that's exactly where we need to be. Read one more place. And we're going to close. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. The Bible says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Now Paul speaking of Peter the apostle and he confronts Peter on some issues. Notice what it says. For before, before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with the dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, what compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentile, knowing the man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. Now, what that says in the second time that Peter fell flat on his face, and I want you to see that he also influenced Barnabas to do the same thing. See, when you become an influence to others, always be certain it's a good one. And so what, he, what they were doing is uh, adding back in the old guy carries all, where Jews sat at one table and, and, and the Gentiles sat over here. And Peter, I mean, Paul would sit down there and eat with all of them. And so he would, and Bible says he would stood Peter to his face and said, This is wrong. Well, what, what are you teaching these people? You know what? That shows me that you can fall on your face multiple times. Because remember in Acts chapter. Uh, two, he was threatened with his life and he declared unto them Christ. Acts chapter 4, he does the very same thing. Acts chapter 10, he takes the gospel to the Gentiles. He took the gospel to the Gentiles before, before Paul did. So he was successful and successful and then fell flat on his face again. You know what that teaches me? You'll be successful today and probably bust your face tomorrow. And all I can say is get up, dust your face off, and keep going. That, that's what we as the Lord's people need to do. But I will say this, and this is not in the Bible, so I can't stand on it with both feet. But I will say this. According to history, Peter's last request was to be hang, hung upside down to the right side up because he said he wasn't good enough to die as Christ had died. And you know, that, that's a pretty good testimony in it. So if you fall down today, pray about it, get up, and try to get tomorrow. And uh, desire that closeness. Do what is, whatever's necessary to get you five minutes alone and desire that closeness with the Lord. And uh, you'll be like Solomon. You'll come down to the point and you think, well, that's the only thing that's important anyway. <laughs>